Okay, so probably it would be best to to start. So I am here with Kai Yang Lau. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Welcome. <laughs> um, and um, as a planner and spatial an analyst with Sasaki Strategies, Kai Yang Lau works to bring a spatial and data-driven approach to planning strategies by working together with planners to generate solutions that reflect the local context and community priorities. She is here today and she is going to be talking about her work, well, in relation with PyQGS and RGODA for Parks and Equity. So, Kai, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's session on Parks and Equity. Uh, my name is Kai Ying Lau, and I'm an urban planner at Sasaki with an interest in using spatial analysis to inform um, our planning and design process. So, Today, I'll be sharing an application of PyQGIS and RGODA for evaluating localized equitable park access across the United States. The project I'm sharing today is part of Sasaki's annual research grants. Um, Sasaki is an urban planning, design, architecture, and interior design firm based in Boston. This project stemmed from ideas on how to expand or go beyond the common metric of evaluating cities, which looks at the percentage of the population within a 10 minute walk of a park. But park access isn't just about whether a person is within a 10 minute walk. It's also about the size of the park, what amenities it has, if it's well maintained, and how all of these factors vary by neighborhood and community. So in our initial data search, we did explore park amenities and park quality, but the data for that at a large scale, if we're looking at multiple cities within the US, just isn't widely available. Um, so today I'll be focusing on how we looked at park size and which communities have access and which don't. There were three research questions for this project, um, but the main question we'll be addressing today is across urbanized areas in the US, who are the communities being served by parks? and who is left out. In starting this project, we wanted to dive into bringing more nuance to park access metrics through consideration of factors like population density, park size, and demographics. So we started to explore and think about what other alternative methodologies could take in into account those factors um, when measuring park access. The Trust for Public Land is a U.S. nonprofit organization with a mission to create parks and protect land for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities for generations to come. What the TPL has done is expanded this to include criteria such as park acreage, investment, amenities, and equity. And you can see this in the park score on the bottom left for Boston. And the reason why it's important for park planners and urban planners to measure park access beyond the 10-minute walk is because there are places like Boston where the whole city is within a 10 minute walk of a park, as shown in the image to the right, um, where the 10 minute walk service areas are highlighted in light green. So for this project, what we aim to do was to spatialize where the areas with the lowest park access per capita are located and understand what the demographics are in those areas. For this project's methodology, we calculate how many park acres per capita each census block has access to, taking into account access to multiple parks. And the reason why we looked at acres of parkland per thousand capita is because it's a park metric used as standard um, from the NRPA, which is the National Recreation and Park Association. We tested this methodology on 19 cities across the US. And the data we use is from TPL. They have a nationwide parks data set as well as 10 minute walk isochromes for each of those parks. We also use demographic data from the US Census Bureau. So there are four main sections within the methodology. The first is pre-processing, which mainly consists of prepping the demographic data, selecting the census blocks within a half mile of the city boundary, selecting parks and 10 minute walk isochrones within a half mile buffer of the city boundary, 
and then projecting everything to the appropriate projections for each location. Once the data sets have been prepped, we calculated parks acreage per thousand capita for each of these census blocks. We used PyQGIS to iterate through these calculations for the 19 cities. First, we calculated the total population that lives within a 10 minute walk of each park by using the summarize by location tool. And as an example here um, on the right, we see a total population of 10 living in census blocks that intersect um, with a 10 minute walk isochrone. We then calculated park acreage per thousand capita by just creating a new field um, and dividing park acreage by that total population. We then ran summarized by location again, but on the census blocks to sum up the park acreage per thousand capita for any 10 minute walk circles that intersected. Um, so for this census block on the right, if we add up the park acreage per thousand capita for every 10 minute walk um, <clears throat> that intersects the boundary, we get a sum of 300 park acreage. Um, per thousand capita. And these numbers are all kind of made up right now, so they don't really mean anything. Um, so once each census block has park acreage per thousand capita, um, we ran a cluster analysis to determine areas of significantly low and high parkland access. To do this, we used Geoda, which is an open source spatial statistics software that runs analyses like local spatial autocorrelation, which is what we use here. The analysis we performed is called univariate local Morin's eye, and it identifies if a census block is within a significantly low or high spatial cluster. To automate running the analysis for 19 cities, we used RGEODA, um, which is an R package for spatial data analysis based on LibGeoda and Geoda. Once we have the cluster results added to the individual city's census block shapefiles, we then generated summary statistics by low or high clusters for the race slash ethnicity variables that we had prepared. These summary statistics leads us to the last step, which was exploring demographics in low high park access clusters. Um, and the main question we focused on for this was what is the race ethnicity breakdown within low high access clusters? And how does that compare to the citywide race ethnicity breakdown? The census blocks that fall kind of in between um, those two, um, for the most part, mean that there weren't really any significant clusters in those locations. So there are some caveats to this methodology. Um, and I apologize for all the text on the slide. But the first is that the underlying data is still based on a 10 minute walk isochrone. Um, this doesn't take into account different walk or access sheds based on other factors such as park use or whether a larger park would have a larger surface service area. It also doesn't take into account people's ability to access the park beyond walking. And we're also missing other factors like park quality, which might be reflected through investment and amenities. The second caveat is that the census data used at the time of the project, which was about 2017 to 2018, was slightly outdated. Um, the five-year American community surveys are only good to evaluate at the track level um, due to large margin of areas at smaller spatial units like blocks. But the summary by location analysis at the track level um, didn't really generate meaningful clusters. So what we did instead was to use census 2010 block level data and ACS 2012 to 2017 track level data to roughly estimate block level data for 2012 to 2017. However, um, this year, the Census 2020 redistricting data summary files have been released, and this includes population and race as well as other basic demographic data, um, and that is all available at the block level. Lastly, processing time in, P in PyQGIS um, was pretty slow given that we had a lot of census blocks to go through for each city. Um, we didn't use PostGIS, and I honestly don't have experience using it, but perhaps that might be a way to help reduce processing time. Um, this was also my first project using PyQGIS and RGOTA, so perhaps there might be more efficient ways to structure the code that might have improved processing time. All right, so this last section, um, I'll be sharing results for just one city, New Orleans, as a way to demonstrate how we were thinking through our results. <coughs> First, um, let's explore looking at acres of park access per capita. So this map represents results you would get from step two, which was calculating park acreage per thousand capita for each census block. 
Anywhere that is white is less than one acre per thousand residents. And as it gets darker green, that means there's increasing park access. And then if we take note of where the cutoff for the low park access and high park access clusters are, we start seeing a pattern where the white areas are significantly low in park access per capita, and the dark green areas are significantly high in park access per capita. If we symbolize the map according to the clusters, we see that the low cluster areas are generally outside of the 10 minute walk from large and medium sized parks, as highlighted in um, the circle on the right. But if we compare that to the 10 minute walk from TPL, um, which is this image to the top right, uh, we see that a lot of the significantly low clusters are within a 10 minute walk of park. Um, but the parks do look pretty small as seen in the circle on the left. So one reason for this might be that these parks in this area are just too small to support the population density in this area. When we start observing what the racial disparities might be in regards to park access, um, we start by looking at the summary statistics for low high parkland access areas. We see that over half of the population living in low parkland areas is black, while over half of the population living in high parkland areas is white. And to really understand what those numbers mean, we need a benchmark. Um, and so we used the citywide population distribution as a reference point, assuming that the expected population distribution in each low high cluster would match the citywide population distribution. Um, so within the city, 30%, 32% of the population is white, um, and we would expect to see that same number um, under low and high. Um, and 56% of the population is black, and we would expect to see that number um, for low and high as well. When we compare that to the distribution within high park access areas, um, for the white population, there's 70% more white residents than expected, so 55 divided by 32. Um, and while we are seeing 40% fewer black residents than expected. And we can tie back um, what we've learned from the summary statistics back to a map. Here, we're looking at a dot density map of race slash ethnicity distribution in low parkland area access areas. We do see that the majority of the population in low access areas is black, but we can also see where those people live. And if I were a park planner um, looking at, at this, I would probably also start overlaying other information I know about the city, like neighborhoods, income, um, historical events, et cetera, to de help determine which areas really do need more park investment. So where do we go from here? How could um, results like this be useful for city and park planners? The methodology is pretty simple. Um, and since data is available to use for this analysis, especially with the 2020 census now, it's a good starting point to dive deeper into learning more about park access equity. Um, and this can certainly inform decision making on where to prioritize new parks and park investment. What did we learn during the process? Uh, well, we definitely found out that park quality data is lacking, um, and it didn't seem like there is a standard for measuring park quality. Um, so that metric is something that uh, needs a bit more investigation. On the next slide, we'll also be sharing a use case for what we could do if we did have park quality data. In the future, um, and we did start doing this towards the end of the project, uh, but one consideration for next steps is to overlay other data sets, such as redlining data from mapping inequality, spatializing the effects of historical events and policies, and how that might have impacted the city today. Um, because chances are that all of those policies have affected how neighborhoods and communities were shaped in the city and still have an impact today. So if you recall from the beginning of this presentation, two of our research questions were focused on how to visualize inequities in park quality for different demographic groups, especially for communities of color and low-income communities. So how can we provide tools or data to help cities make targeted investments in parks with an equity lens? As part of this project, we launched a beta tool for visualizing and interacting with park, park amenities, maintenance ratings, data, and overlaying that with access and demographic variables. 
Here we managed to get part quality data from LA. Um, and so in this tool, we're demonstrating how we can adjust travel isochrones for different modes from different types of park amenities and also filter by park quality. On the right, um, the graphs there is showing a summary of who lives in these areas um, that have and don't have access to a 15 minute transit ride from a good quality basketball court. And if you want to learn more about how the tool was built, I encourage you to check out the recordings of Ken Golding's Phosphor-G sessions. Um, one is titled Zaru, which is about real-time interactive dashboards. Um, and the second is titled Where are the Data Tiles? So lastly, um, I want to say that this project would not have been possible without the rest of the team leading this effort, as well as the grant supported from Sasaki. Um, and my contact information is here. So thank you all for listening in today and feel free to contact me. Um, and I guess uh, we can open it up for Q&A now. Indeed, thank you very much for your presentation and for keeping everything in, in time. <laughs> um, Okay, let's go to questions. Um, question number one, do you have information about the level of racial inequity in other cities? What about income? Yeah, so we ran this analysis on 19 cities. I didn't show all the results for that. Um, we did want to include income in the beginning, but I believe with the census 2010 data, um, from what I remember, like the different income levels aren't included in that census. Um, what we did have was poverty rate. So we do have poverty, poverty rate for each census block included as well. So we did also look at that and we had, we have a few um, dot density maps um, that looks at poverty rate um, and comparing that to low access, uh, low park access clusters. Um, and I'm happy to, if you're willing to reach out, I'm happy to you know share those as well. Thank you. Uh, next question. You mentioned lacking park quality data. Do we have any obvious filters for bad parks, let's say, such as golf courses? Yeah, so I think that actually goes um, to how the like parks shape file is created. Um, for TPL, they did not include golf courses. Um, they focused on public parks that are available to anyone to enter. So it, yeah, it really just goes down to your park data set, making sure that if the intention is to focus more on providing park spaces that are publicly available, of course, you would have to remove um, any parks that aren't fully publicly available, parks that might have barriers to cost, etc. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question number three. What was the process like for using your spatial data uh, within the R geodata package? Did you convert to SF from Python? Was that smooth? Yeah, um, I think we did use SF. Um, and actually on our GitHub, which here I can, let me see how I can switch my screen. Um, on our GitHub, I did upload the code and the code is pretty old because we did this like two or three two years ago, and there has been like updates to the RGOTA package. Um, but you can see in that code how we brought in the shape files. It, it wasn't difficult at all. Um, so you can take a look at that and let me know how it goes, <laughs> if it still works. <laughs> OK. And I think this next question is somehow related. I noticed that the version uh, number for RGO is only 008 geodata itself is at version 1.2. What does the 00 version number for our geodata indicate? So, yeah. So our, for our geoda, actually, our, the our geoda package had only like, we only discovered it when we were doing this analysis and we noticed that it had just been released like two weeks before we started this project, um, which was really lucky for us because that meant that I didn't have to use like Geoda 19 times for the different cities. Um, so it's it's a relatively like new package. Um, and that's probably why um, the version numbers are different there. Thank you. And one more question. Are only parts of the underlying C++ implementation of Geoda available in the R API or something else? 
That's a good question. Um, I'm not too sure, um, but it's probably an interesting thing to look into. I've only used it in, I've only used Geoda in its software itself and in our Geoda. Um, I think there might be a Pi Geoda as well. Um, I didn't really look into it, but that's the- mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, it is because I've 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 also noticed the the comments in the chat and yeah in the chat so it is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, five. To what extent uh, do your axis measurements anti or correlate with population density? I'm sorry. Can you? Okay. Uh, yeah, we also place the. Uh, this one here. Yeah. Um, so the park access measurements taken, like, include population density in the, like, summarize um, to location uh, calculations. Um, so I'm not sure if it makes sense to do a correlation between those park metrics with population density, given that um, that was already included in the calculations. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, maybe just one from me. I'm curious if you've ever succeeded in interacting with any kind of authority that can do something about the, the results that you've got from your analysis. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in the team members, there's like three Three people who who have been really leading the effort, Laura, Jill, and Elaine, and they have had you know conversations with cities. We actually, I think, we did actually talk to New Orleans, um, and we've presented some of this data to see if any of this would be useful to them. I believe we have shared the data with them. Um, I would probably need to follow up with them on on like exact words from the cities that they've talked to on how it's been helpful for them. Um, but we, yeah, we have reached out to some cities and shared um, our findings to them. And we do really hope that it helps. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, we have time for one more question, which is a bit longer. So I did not see if you looked at Baltimore in the TPL analysis, we actually reversed the race inequality with Koch having better access than white citywide. White citywide, sorry. But that is because of large parks with little access, but redlined neighborhoods showing the low access trend. Do you have any thoughts about how to improve analysis to avoid this pitfalls? Um, maybe I can also uh, copy paste the uh, the question in the chat so you can also look at it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, because it's, um, it's longer. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I oh Baltimore was one of the cities. Um, I don't remember what the results were, but I'm happy to share them if you reach out. Um, for your the second half of the question, I hope I'm interpreting this right. Um, I think this is talking about um, some part. Some cities like New or New Orleans actually had this issue. There's like a large park reservation that was included in the analysis, and that really throws off the clustering. Um, so what we actually did in our geoda was we ran the analysis on z scores, but then we did a cap at like 95%, so that any out any parks with like super large acreages wouldn't be throwing off um, the analysis. So that's how we handled that. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think. Uh... Yeah, I think we don't have any more questions. Let me just check one more time. Yeah, we don't have any more questions and we are on time. So thank you very much, Kai, for your time, for your answers, for your presentation. And enjoy what is left of the of the presentations here in, in Phosphor-G and then join the code sprint and, um, well, enjoy what is, <laughs> what is there left. So uh, thanks and bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay, we are going to um, be back.